So I'm going to talk first. I'm Tom Habib, and my topic is intimate couples become a second tier explorers, and how to create that stable relationship, that second tier, at least float up into second tier occasionally. So, without further ado, is there any other relationship that needs an integral map more than the intimate relationship? It's going to be one of the most complex relationships where everything's emerging at once and it ends up in a dramatic display of emotion and chaos oftentimes. So, I want to start with a quote from the Persian poet Rumi. He seemed to get this right uh, seven decades ago. Your task is not to seek love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you've built against it. And that's what I'm finding when I work with couples. I'm a psychologist and my specialties uh, with couples. It is their barriers, the development of barriers that slow them down from realizing the very intimacy they crave. Oh. <laughs> oh, you want to see that again? Please. <laughs> so I got to speak slow in. <laughs> So, three premises today. Members in the intro community frequently have second tier capabilities, but they find themselves in an intimate relationship that floats at first tier. We'll get too depressed on that yet. The intimate relationship versus all other relationships is the most difficult place to create second tier space. And I'm going to get into some of the nuances why. I know it doesn't seem like it should be that way, but it is. And then attempts to achieve the we space in the intimate relationship will reveal the blocks within each of us that are prohibited from happening. Remember, it's two people that are doing it. So, if I could rewrite the marital vows for everybody, this is what I would write. Will you take the temper tantrums, the sensitivity, the overreaction, the insecurities, the character defects, the control issues, the unrealistic expectations, the unresolved family issues, and the uncontrolled regressions, for better or for worse. I love it. And, and notice everywhere the quadrants there. And of course, this could be much longer if you really were given informed consent. Did you want to have a picture? This stuff is all online, and either uh, just YouTube my name, or uh, go to the Wisdom Factory, um, and you have cards, and all these documents you can have from them. Okay. So this is the couple's line, and it begins down here at safety and attraction, stage one, goes to stage two, stage three, and we're going to be talking about the transition from stage three to stage four. I have never seen a couple at stage five. Um, I'm only speculating using other people's work how that will show up. And in the chart I left you, I'm contrasting stage four and stage five. So, a brief explanation of each one of these stages, starting at the bottom. Safety and attraction when we first meet is a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful stage that we hope will never end. It's really chemistry and projected ideal that is flowing freely at that moment. And if a couple is really young, as soon as that time ends, because the imperfections in each person that inevitably arise, once they see that, they can't tolerate the young couples break up. If you think stage one's going to last, you're not ready to get married and make a commitment. Um, because it is reality that throws us out of stage one. And do you notice the romantic movies often end at this stage? Because they don't know where to go. The story gets too complicated and the roadmap isn't out there of what's going on you know, at that time. So, 
state. Um, at the heart of stage one is a pre-transcendent fallacy. And remember how Ken described this. A pre-trans fallacy is the mistaken interpretation that a behavior or motive or understanding originates from a higher stage than it actually does. So it's based upon chemistry and enthusiasm rather than the much more highly evolved things of empathy and understanding. And that only comes later on. Thank you. Can you give me an extra few minutes on the presentation? Yeah, yeah, actually, yes. Okay. Good enough, huh? Yeah. So you understand that? Because the pre-trans fallacy is what we all live with. It's a lower left cultural message that's ubiquitous in the West. And it drives everything. It drives everything in terms of women are allowed to age the nonsense around plastic surgery, men idealizing Athena, you know, wanting that type of love. And it's all looking in the wrong direction where the actual love resides. Um, so it's really, I'm going to write a paper next on that lower left quadrant, taking on some of the deconstruction that you heard yesterday of things that have to be taken out of the thought process so that we know which way to go. Am I going slow enough? It was slower. Stage two. So reality is what throws everybody into stage two. Is your partner's imperfections show up, uh, your, your mixed feelings and ambivalence show up, and the dream is assaulted by reality. You retain some of it, but because of the limitations of each person, um, it changes. And how strongly you react to this stage has a lot to do with predicting future stability in the relationship. And there's two persistent fantasies that I don't want you to forget in this stage. The first one is, I got involved with the wrong person. How many of you had that fantasy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> The second one is, other people get to live at safety and attraction. Because think, everything in the culture is suggesting that's where the true love uh, uh, arises. Is the two persistent fantasies, have you already heard? One of the persistent fantasies is, I picked the wrong person. <laughs> the second persistent fantasy is, other people get to live as safety and attraction. And I don't care what the movies say. I don't care what the popular culture says. You don't, you don't discover that relationship, you build it. And it's work to get there. Even that people here that are capable of entering the second tier, it's still work. And we're going to talk about how to do that as I get going. So the third stage is relational. And like I said, this didn't come on until the 60s. This is a monumental leap in development. This is when equality started to set in, at least as an ideal. we give and take work in the relationship. We went from a traditional role relationship to we actually try to achieve partnership. And in this stage, um, the idea of a soulmate began to emerge. They were not capable of realizing it yet, but because of the expansion into the next stage, people could feel into some of the possibilities that I'm going to talk about later on and how to get there. Now, the problem in this stage, too, is the two persistent fantasies, which is what? And the second one? Yeah, there's the safety right. You gotta get rid of that fantasy. It doesn't exist. Um, and we don't know that until we get up to, to the next stage. So um, there's a lot more on this. You could just go to either one of these websites, uh, put in my name Tom Habib, and really good lengthy treatments of this on videos uh, will be there. Or if you want to take a deeper dive from a more academic position, 
go to uh, uh, academia.edu and put my first name in it. And you can hear a lot more on it. But I'll finish this line because we're going to talk about how do we actually get into first love. I only believe this is accessible at this time because remember, spiritual love I'm speculating about. I've never seen that couple. But I do believe this first love, and I call it first love because you're really finally in love with your partner. You're not in love with that projection anymore. Um, that lower left message is not tormenting you as much when you finally arrive at this level. And this is the way I want to introduce first love, to give you a feel for it first. So imagine if you were sick, and you had this great neighbor, and they came over, they did a few loads of laundry, they cooked you lunch, uh, they took care of the children, they vacuumed, they went to the dry cleaners and picked up the clothing. Wouldn't that be an incredible neighbor? Wouldn't your gratitude soar and you couldn't wait to reciprocate in terms of the service? When we think about it, that's what our spouses do day in and day out. It's that gratitude on what they're actually doing is the ground upon which we build for a slope. One of the things I observe as a psychologist clinically watching couples and that got me thinking about this as I read Wilbur. Why is it that a couple can do 85% of their relationship well, and it's the 15% wrong that becomes 80% of their evaluation and state experience of the relationship? Isn't this true? Mm -hmm. It's that absolute catastrophizing the limitations because the vulnerability of intimacy. What a lawful moment. Say it again. <laughs> it's that catastrophizing of the limitation of the relationship because of the vulnerability of intimacy. Did I say it open? <laughs> so this is what put me on to the couple's line. When I understood the relationship to the pre-trans fallacy, and I put this all together after reading, uh, you know, Wilbur and all the, that book with all the lines in the back of it, I started thinking about it and said, wow, I can develop a couple's line. So this is first love, is when we begin to realize that our partner has sacrificed and they've committed their life to us, day in, day out, to grow, and we look at the abundance of what is rather than overreacting to the ruptures and what isn't, then we're on the path that we need to get there. Now, that's not it. There's going to be a lot more in terms of directors, how we actually do this. So, I'm just going to mention this, uh, this slide for a second, and then we're going to do a deeper dive into spiritual love. This is rarefied ground for the very few. What do you have to have online in terms of your own personal practices to show up without backing away is probably way beyond certainly my ability. My wife Christine and I can only float up in the first slow occasionally when we're mindful of those moments. Is I, I, I have never seen a couple that can do this. Um, yeah, and you have this handout, so I just want to give you a feel for what's involved both in first love and in spiritual love, what you have to have online. So look, in first love there's increasing awareness of shadow, in spiritual love, shadow signals an opportunity for more growth. They're going, whoa, I didn't see that. Let's, let's go further. All the upper right visceral reactions calm down. Sometimes when I get a couple to look at each other, they practically levitate on the couch out of panic. Um, so you can see how much has to come online. So number two, some ability to look at yourself while your partner observes. 
They're looking at you in a transparent way. <laughs> it's like an Irish time. Oh, Jesus. Um, here, it's quick adjustments. I mean, here the transparency is there. There's total transparency why your partner observes. Um, so I'm going to let you read through some of these because we're, we're going to run out of time. And you can do these yourself and feel the nuances of the differences, but it's a tall order. Uh, Christine said to me, do you want to say something? What do you mean by no, uh, no propensity for your own pre-trans Yeah, no propensity for lower left pre-trans fallacies. That the way they relate to the lower left is much more realistic. They understand the difference between the ideal and the reality. They don't get confused. It doesn't set up all that longing for what, what isn't. It's, it's wanting what you want, as Cheryl Crow said in his song once. But I do want to get to the directives, because this is really the good stuff. Okay. So we're going to talk about how we get from here to there because that's what's actually is successful. And the goal is to devote, develop first love, and we're gonna prolong moments of resonance and shared healing. That's how we're gonna do it. And, and we're deciding with our partner ahead of time, you're gonna look into each other's eyes for 30 seconds. That's not too bad, is it? 30 seconds. But we're going to use an external source of poignancy and intensity to generate the pathway between us. Can you feel that with me? So, so watch. So we use an emotionally laden move, moment, like a movie, music. Usually in movies, what I love, you, you know what, if you have children, when a child is struggling, and they start to achieve something, and we feel it so deeply, and we're choking on it, we're deciding for 10 to 30 seconds not to look away, to look at each other, calm it down, try not to smile or laugh, because it grooves a pathway of empathy I'm finding when we do that. So you decide ahead of time, and you do it. Now you have to do it six to nine times before it develops some traction. Um, so number two. So there's number one, prolong eye contact. Once you've done it six to nine times, you're trying to feel beyond that moment and try to feel for all the mothers and fathers, if that's the moment you're using, that have struggled with children before. Are you with me? So it's the resonance that seems to be there all the time. Like when I walk in some of those great cathedrals, I can feel people at their higher selves for hundreds of years there. I don't know what it is. But that's the resonance you're trying to feel uh, once you have step one done. <clears throat> Notice how it becomes easier to enter this space once you've done it a number of times. You begin to slip right into it because that pathway is there. You've calmed down the physiology. You, you've developed it. Okay, I'm going to erase it. Um, notice the commonality in countless other people. We begin to initiate this we space. We don't need a movie anymore. We just do it with the look of the eye. You know, that eye contact. And it opens up that sacred space. Can you feel that with me? You've probably done it with other people here. But one of the reasons it's so hard to do it with an intimate partner is you've got to compartmentalize the times they've hurt you. Do you understand compartmentalize? No. You put it aside and you don't let it contaminate this moment. Because often people, when they go to the vulnerability, they access vulnerability because of deficit and damage. So you've got to compartmentalize that to open the positive space. So the rest of this online, I'm running out of time. 
and we had to slow this down a little bit. The rest of this is online, just steps. Take a look at some of the videos and you can, you can see how to do this. And I'd love to hear feedback, how well this works for you, because this is very much a model in uh, development. Thank you very much for all of you coming.